and welcome to this fifth in a series of six devotionals on the topic of Old Testament passages that teach us things about the rapture and the return of Christ. You remember when we began, we talked about how Paul was saying, I'm, un I'm unveiling to you a mystery, uh, uh, something that had been in God's plan and in the scriptures, but veiled so that we wouldn't understand it until the proper time. And then he revealed about the rapture and return of Christ, that we would be changed in a moment, and that we would not all die. There would be a generation that would be taken up to be with God in the in this life, before ending this life. We would go up to be with Him. And we're looking at that, and looking at scriptures of the Old Testament that show us things about that. You know, there was another time, though, that Paul said he was unveiling a mystery, and this mystery was this, that marriage between the man and the woman was a picture of what would be Christ and his church. There would be the church that would be the bride of Christ. Now, the bride of Christ is the focus of Jesus' coming for his people, in the rapture, before he returns to earth to reign from Israel, and with, in between those two events being a tribulation period where he deals with the nation of Israel, preparing them in Daniel's, Daniel's 70th week. Those seven years are going to be a time period of tribulation on the earth and a time of, of trouble and, and preparation of God's people Israel. The church has to be taken out of the way for that to happen. Now, if, we, if one of those mysteries is that the church was the bride of Christ that has been revealed, we would expect to find things in the scriptures that were already there that taught us things about that too. And we do. We find that in the story of Isaac and Rebekah in Genesis chapter 24. Now, Isaac, of course, is a forerunner of Christ. Christ is one of his descendants. And Isaac is also a type of Christ in the scriptures. That doesn't mean he is Christ, and it doesn't mean that everything in his life was something that Christ also would do, but it does mean that there are events in Isaac's life that are a spiritual picture of what God's plan was for Isaac's descendant, the Lord Jesus Christ, to fulfill prophetically speaking. And we see that throughout Isaac's life. Uh, Isaac was a child promised beforehand, as the Christ was promised beforehand. Isaac was a child that had to be waited for by faith for a long time before that fulfillment would come, just as it would be with Christ and the Old Testament prophets. Isaac was finally conceived and born miraculously, as it would be with Christ. Not virgin born because Isaac was just a man, not God. But his conception and birth was miraculous and, and in a response to faith, as, as uh, the Messiah would come in that way. Isaac would be born as the one known as the, the only son, the beloved son. These are things that would be said of Christ. Uh, Isaac would also be a picture of Christ in the cross and resurrection. As God the Father would tell Abraham, Isaac's father, to do or at least picture what God the Father would do with his son. He would tell him, go and sacrifice your only son Isaac, whom you love. Sacrifice him on this mountain which uh, Bible scholars believe is actually the location where Calvary would be. And that uh, Abraham took Isaac there, and he was prepared to sacrifice for him there, and he said, God will provide himself a lamb. Prophetically speaking, not just about God providing a lamb in Isaac's place, but providing a lamb in your place and mine. God's son would be the one sacrificed, not Abraham's son. God's son would be the one sacrificed for all of us to be saved. But Isaac would be a picture of that. And he would willingly go. He would willingly lay himself on that altar as a sacrifice and allow himself to die. But of course we know God stopped Abraham before he actually went through with it 
making the sacrifice, and they sacrificed the lamb in his place. And, and the New Testament tells us that when Isaac was then received back by his father, it was, it was like Abraham was receiving Isaac from the dead. Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac, it says, because he knew God was able to raise him from the dead. So he believed Isaac was going to die, but he believed Isaac was going to be brought back to life. He had told the servants, we will see you. We will come back to you after we worship. He knew Isaac was going to come back alive, even though he didn't know everything about how it was going to happen. So Isaac is a picture of the cross, the sacrifice, that his descendant Christ would do, and the resurrection. Well, what does Isaac do then? He goes back with his father. He lives in the household of his father. And time passes. And Isaac's absent from the story for a while. Just with time passing, he's with his father. And after time passes, at the right time, Abraham, representing God the Father by type here, says, it's time for my son Isaac to have his bride so that he can have that relationship with her. The time has come. So just as there, there is now a, a wait for Christ in heaven, he's waiting right now, there is going to come a proper time, just like Isaac's birth was at the proper time after a wait. Christ's first coming was at the proper time after a wait. Now there is a time of waiting to be united with his bride. And that day is coming. And in Genesis chapter 24, we are going to see some things that by type are a, a spiritual picture of things to come. Yet to come still. Abraham says... I am old, I'm advanced in age, now it's time for my son Isaac to have a bride. And he commissions his servant to go. And he, these are the things he tells his servant. You will not take a bride for my son Isaac from here in the land of Canaan. Geographically, what would be Israel and is today. The bride would not come from Israel. Israel is God's people. The place of Canaan is Abraham's place. But the bride would not come from there. The bride would come from where Abraham was from. Now, Abraham was from, from a, a land away from there. And geographically, you know where the place Abraham was from, that region, what it would become? It would become Babylon one day. And when the book of Revelation talks about Christ and his bride, he's telling the bride, come out from her, Babylon, and come out from her and be separate from her. The bride of Isaac would come from there and would be called not to stay there, but to come to Isaac. The bride of Christ is going to be called to go to Christ. And it's going to happen without Christ coming here first. He's going to be in the air waiting for us. And we will be called to go, to go up to him. That's what the Abraham says is to happen for, for, for the, his servant that's going to get the bride for her, Isaac. And the servant asks him, well, what if she won't go for, with me? Do I then take Isaac to that land and find a bride for her? And he says, no, you will not take Isaac to that land. If, she, if, if no bride will come, then you're free of your oath, but you will not take Isaac to that land to find the bride. Christ would not be on the earth to find his own bride. He, that's, that wasn't the plan. Christ came to Israel. He stayed in the land all of his years living on this earth. He stayed in the land. He never left it. But God commissioned people to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And the mystery to be revealed was that the, the ones, all of us of the world who came to know the Lord would be the bride of Christ, taken out of the nations, not taken out of Israel. 
God still, of course, has his plans for Israel, and they're very important. God still has his promises for Israel, and they will all be fulfilled. But we see from the very beginning here, before Isaac took his bride, that God already had the plan in place for how things were going to unfold. The bride of Christ would not be of Canaan, of Israel. The bride of Christ would be of the nations. And, and on Christ's behalf, others would bring that bride in. And so the, the, the servant goes in that chapter, and he goes looking for that bride in Mesopotamia, the city of Nahor, the location that would be Babylon one day. And he goes to the well, and he asks God, show me the one. Show me the right one. And in, in the things he says, we see some characteristics of what God would find in the bride that he had prepared for his son. See, the servant looks for loving kindness in this bride. The servant looks for a servant heart in this bride. The servant says, let the one who, who if I ask for water, says, I'll, I'll not only give you water, but I'll keep on drawing water until I've given water to your ten camels. And, and I'll make sure everything, you, your, your people, your, your animals are ministered to. I'll do it all for you. And he says, Lord, let the one who says that to me be the one you've selected for a bride. And the, the, the bride of Christ that's being prepared is a bride that serves. The, the bride of Christ in the earth today serves the Lord, serves God, and serves humanity and serves the world and, and helps the world in many things. There's, as Greg Laurie has put it, and perhaps others too, he's the one I heard say it, there, the church in the world has many critics, but no rivals. Uh, there's, there's nothing like the bride of Christ, the bride that has been prepared to be wed to Christ one day. There is a servanthood of the bride of Christ. Christians, true Christians that know the Lord are servants of others. They're good to others. They're good to humanity. As, as one member of the bride of Christ, you can be doing that too. As one, one member, one part of the body of the bride of Christ. You can be that too to those around you. As a whole, there is no question, no question that that describes the bride of Christ. Is there's no question that God has already prepared a bride that is without spot or wrinkle, ready to be wed to Christ when the proper time comes. Uh, it's not that the church isn't without problems. It's not that the church isn't infiltrated by people that aren't even believers. But as a whole, you cannot look at this world realistically, and you cannot look at the church realistically and not see something absolutely marvelous, and not see something that is beyond humanity and its sinful nature, able to live like Christ in the world. That is what we see when we look at the church. If you've dropped out of church because you think that's not what is there, well then, repent and get back. Because the bride of Christ is wonderful, glorious, beautiful. Worshiping together with God's people is wonderful. And you can't bear to miss out on that. You can't afford to miss out on that just because you have seen some problems here and there. The bride of Christ is wonderful. And don't you dare join in with the enemy of our souls, the accuser of the brethren, by downing the body of Christ with your speech and the thoughts of your heart. You acknowledge the truth of what Christ has made us. We are a special people, not because of us, because of Christ. Yet there is no denying that the bride of Christ is beautiful and glorious. And as we're awaiting our bride, you know, Rebecca did not know that day that her groom was waiting for her. He didn't, she did not know that day that she was going to be told, here, come to meet your groom. She didn't know. But she was serving. And she was being good. She was being good above and beyond. 
She didn't owe this man these things. She wasn't obliged to do these things for this man, but she did it. And this servant then sees that she's the one and, and she takes him to her home. And he says, look, my master Abraham is very blessed of God. He is very rich. And he wants his the bride for his son Isaac. And she tells the story of how God has revealed that Rebekah is to be that one. And he gives gold and he gives gifts to them. Because the bride of Christ is showered with gifts in, in preparation for being wed to Christ. And those blessings spread around beyond her to, to her family there. And, they, and uh, they want to delay her going. They want to delay her going. And it has been a long wait for Isaac to get of his bride, but now it's time. So the servant says, no, no, I don't want to wait more time. I don't want to wait ten more days. Night is falling. It's time. She must go with me tomorrow. And they say, well, we'll ask her. And she says, yes, I'll go. The bride will be willing to go when Christ comes for us. When, when he appears in the heavens and when the voice of the archangel calls out to us come up here or something equivalent to that the world may not be pleased that you're going you will be pleased that you're going you'll be willing to go and she goes and she's brought to Isaac and Isaac brings her into his tent and she becomes his bride and they celebrate that relationship and that that act uh, of consecration together and and fulfilling all of the things that marriage is as a mystery of Christ and his bride which is we the church are the bride of Christ and he's coming for us and he's coming for us to take us out of this land staying in his land after that happens he will establish his kingdom in Israel after the tribulation period but uh, we've had the long wait but the time is coming and when the time comes there will be no delay he'll, he'll be here we will be changed in an instant we will be brought up together with him out of Babylon into his kingdom and will be his bride forever there is a special role in eternity that we the church will have there's a special role in eternity that, that Israel will have. And there's a special role in eternity that, that tribulation saints will have. And a special role in eternity that people saved during the millennial kingdom will have. But we, we're the only ones, all, all of those that we've mentioned will be in heaven and be in the, the eternal home of God and the new heavens and the new earth. But that's our special role, to be the bride of Christ. And to be the bride of Christ right now means waiting for him to come for us announcing the, that the wedding has come the angel will announce it to us he won't come to us to get us he'll he'll be sending someone on his behalf and we'll be taken up to him to be with him in the air and celebrate that look forward to it and rejoice in these two mysteries uh that were hidden that were in the Old Testament but veiled, but have been unveiled for us, that we can know them and be prepared for things to come. Lord willing, sometime soon we will have our sixth video in the series, which I think will be the, the conclusion of the series, because I only have the six in mind. Perhaps in my study, God will give me opportunity to do more, but right now it's planned to be one more after this video. And uh, blessings to you.